Okay, let's go ahead and uh, pick back up again. We want to get going with some demonstrations. Love demos. We're going to talk now about mitigating voltage sags and momentary type events that can occur on a system. And if you start to think about that and how you're going to do it, there are different strategies. And there's different costs. But one of the things that we've learned through a lot of testing over the years and a lot of research and a lot of practical application and work with industrials is the more you know about the knowledge of your equipment sensitivity, the lower cost your solution can be. So if you know there's a control issue in here because there's a weak relay, your cost can be very inexpensive to make that, change that one relay out that you're using to something more robust. It could be a hundred bucks at that level. Or we might want to look at power conditioning. How do we put a power conditioner in at the control level to make that circuit more robust and then make the controls ride through better? So we're going to talk about that level of solution now. We're going to talk about how to embed solutions down at the control level. The number one thing that you can do, how many of you guys spec equipment that you're going to buy? Either from an OEM or maybe you're going to put this, how many of you guys design and put the systems in yourself? Okay. One of the things that you can do is design with DC power. And I mean that from a control power standpoint. This is one of the most robust methods to make systems more resilient to voltage sags and momentary issues. And it doesn't require you then to have to buy a power conditioner to get through many of these events. And this is an example of, of uh, the slide that we saw earlier had a step down transformer in this location. Here we're using a power supply connected phase to phase and we're stepping from our phase to phase voltage at AC down to our 24 volts DC. And then these are DC components. So the ride through of this system is really all hinging on that DC power supply. And we've seen in many industries that uh, uh, moving in that direction, these DC power supplies can have built-in tolerance again, can depend on the topology, which I'm gonna talk about some. Um, we've seen a lot of OEMs move in that direction. The semiconductor industry pretty much, once we showed them the problem with most of their tools where it was a simple AC ice cube relay, they pretty much moved completely away from that and started doing this type of thing for EMO circuits so that uh, they, they didn't run into that issue again. Now, another thing that you can do is just make your whole um, control power for your system DC. So instead of having a step down transformer, I'm going from AC to DC and I've got a DC maybe emergency off here, or maybe I've got a DC powered PLC and I've got DC IO. Now I've, I've got a complete DC system and if this is a robust DC power supply, which we're gonna talk about how to ensure that the power supply is robust, I don't need a power conditioner and I can make sure those controls are, are pretty hardened to voltage sags. So we're gonna look at how much better this can be from a depth of the sag and the duration of a sag we're also going to look at other things. So let me ask you, what other benefits does 24 volts DC have? Arc flash, okay. Any other? Which is more apt to, uh, to kill you? AC, 120 volts AC. You can die from 120 volts AC. <laughs> 24 volts DC is, uh, is, uh, is um, a lot less of a shock potential. Okay, so some of the design considerations with DC, one of the things that, that you look at for a given load on a DC system, either whether it's a sensor or a contact or whatever you're trying to either sense or control, for the same size wire, Okay, I can go about a fifth of the distance with, an, with a, with a uh, DC wire than I can with an AC. And that's because I'm going from 24 to 18 volts is about how low I can go before the ones become zeros in the PLCs or the, or the off condition for a DC circuit. Okay, so I can't run as far with a DC signal. You see AC IO running all over the place, right? I'm going to go long distance and back. Because uh, your you know your one to zero or your 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 threshold for tripping out is, is quite a bit lower. So, uh, 
what you have to do is think about that when you're using uh, DC. So that means you have a lot more distributed DC I.O., DC remote I.O.s, rather than having all your I.O. in one spot and then running all the wires throughout the whole plant and then coming back to that spot. And, you know, modern design, a lot of people put their I.O. a lot closer to that place they want to sense or control than, they, than in the past. Okay, so let's look at how much better this is. Let's do a demonstration. What I've done while we were on break is I took this PLC and I did a very simple thing to it. I, uh, I switched the, the AC power supply off. So I took this AC input power supply and I turned it off. And then I took a DC input power supply that's in this slot and I turned it on. So now that DC input power supply is feeding the power to that rack. So the 24 volt DC, AC to DC power supply here is feeding the PLC rack um, for all the backplane power. And it's also feeding the DC IO on this rack. So let's see how different this can be. So here's my voltage sag a minute ago, 80% of nominal five cycles. Nothing happened, everything's still running. PLC did not shut down. Let's go a little bit lower. There's about 70% of nominal five cycles. Something up here made a noise, do you hear that? Wonder what happened? Any ideas? The AC ice cube relay is starting to click and starting to chatter. So uh, depending on the depth and the duration of that voltage sag, if I run this out here to about 10 cycles, Okay, I can get to a point where uh, it'll eventually, the PLC is going to sense that it went down and that it dropped out and uh, it's going to shut the, DC, the AC relay off. Okay, so I'm affecting this AC circuit. I'm now in about 60% of nominal for about 10 cycles now and the AC circuit's starting to get affected. But the DC side, the PLC rack and everything's fine. Let me go down lower. I'm just gonna go all the way down for grants all the way to zero volts. So here's 10 cycles at no voltage. You still hear, still hear the AC relay clicking? Our DC side's okay. Let's go 20 cycles. Okay, my AC's dropped out, it's not in anymore. <laughs> but you can hear that the DC side just kept on running, the PLC's still running. 30, half a second. Still going. Did, did it get it? Okay, so about 40 cycles of no voltage in this scenario I was able to achieve ride through by using DC. Now, what I did was I've got an oversized DC power supply. It's less than a quarter percent, quarter loaded, which is not very, I mean, that's not what you would normally do. So this is more of an extreme example, but it does show you uh, with this, this is a single phase input 120 volt supply. Um, this is, uh, does show you how much you can achieve. Now you can also, there are modules that you can add on some stored energy and this will even get it further. And I'm gonna show you some more of those, uh, some more of those techniques. So we went from up here, 80% at one cycle, down to here. 80% at one cycle, down to 40%, uh, uh, 0% at 40 cycles is how this changed with using DC in this example instead of AC and utilizing the stored energy in that DC power supply. This is a actual PLC rack out of the Corvette plant in Bowling Green, Kentucky. This, anybody got the Allen Bradley Slick 500s? Got that? Okay, well the Slicks are, are actually pretty robust. They can ride through voltage sags about, as low as about 47% of nominal, and depending on how many cards are in that rack, uh, they can go down to maybe 20, 20 to 30 cycles of no voltage before they'll trip. And that's because they over-designed that power supply so it could also be used for instruments and, and um, for the 24 volt DC source in the panel. Hardly anybody does that. Uh, but the, they've over-designed the supply for that. And this particular PLC rack, I, I was going through the Corvette plant working on paint booth issues and I said, well, what about this area? They said, no, we don't have any problems. That one's always up and running. And I said, well, why? Let me open it up and let me see what you got in there. So they had DCIO, the blue wires are DC, and they had these three phase input uh, Siemens Cytop DC power supplies. So these are three phase AC input, 
24 volt DC output power supplies, and they even had some redundancy in that, that were able to supply um, the voltage to that panel without it dropping out. And so this system was very robust, and these are the sags that the, that from the transmission fed system that feeds this plant didn't, ex didn't experience shutdowns, and then you can see why. So what are the, in summary, what are some of these things I can think about when I'm using DC power supplies? One of the things, if you're using a switch mode supply, for instance, is just load it halfway. Don't design your system so that they're over uh, up, to the, up to the maximum. So no more than 50% loading on a DC supply. Another thing that you can do, if you're going to connect phase to phase, like a 208 or uh, 240 volt connection for your controls, you can go phase to phase and uh, if you're connected phase to phase on a universal input supply, you could go down to, uh, down to at least a 41% of nominal, uh, and, and these things will typically uh, continue to work. Um, it's amazing how well these things will actually work because uh, 85 volts corresponds to about 41%, which is the low end of where this can, can operate. But the best thing that you can do, one of the very best things that you can do, and this is a uh, especially in 480 volt systems. Now, if you're at a 400 volt system, this will not work as well, but at 480, this works great. There are a lot of vendors that make three phase input, 24 volt DC output power supplies. This is one of them. I'm going to pass it around and let you look at it. This is a Siemens Psi Top. This guy here is a, um, a 40 amp, 24 volt unit with three phase input. Like Phoenix Contact makes one of these, Allen Bradley makes these. The point is, this is a robust way to do it. Now, if you take one of these and you even at fully loaded, it does really well. But if you half load one of these, now you're talking. You've got voltage sag right through, you've got interruption right through on your control. So I'll just pass that around. Who'd like to, you guys are all utility folks, but you can look at it. Pass it around through the different tables and just take a look at what we're talking about there. So three phase input systems, um, 24 volt DC outputs. This is a very robust way to make a control voltage. So let me summarize this. If you have an unregulated DC power supply and it's connected typically phase to neutral in this example, that means it doesn't have capacitors in it. So if the input goes it down because of a voltage sag, it's gonna have a very high uh, voltage sag tolerance curve, which means it's gonna, or it's gonna trip very early. So this means it'll trip for most all voltage sags that it sees. If you have a regulated linear DC power supply, it's gonna do better, okay? Uh, or even if you had a, a linear DC power, uh, this is a regulated linear, it's going to do better. If you half load that, it's going to do even better than that. Uh, if you take a switch mode DC power supply, because the nature of how the switch mode controls work, it's going to do typically better than a linear. But if you take this 480 volt, three phase switch mode power supply, three phase input, you can have a single phase sag all the way to zero volts and it won't shut it down. Okay? And so uh, it takes a pretty significant two phase sag as well. Um, and depending on how you size it, you can get significant ride through out of it. Again, the universal input power supply for a single phase sag all the way down to zero volts on a phase to phase connected, it can still have enough uh, uh, voltage available phase to phase to actually continue to work even though you can have one phase go all the way to zero if you're referencing phase to phase. So these, these are the strategies. This is the one that's most applicable to general industrial applications right here. Another thing that you can do if you want to make sure you've got some ride through time, let's say you've already got a power supply and it is sourcing your, your DCIO and your PLC, you want to make sure you've got exist more ride through time, you can actually add one of these buffer supply, buffer modules. And what this does is it hooks in on the DC bus of the 24 volts and it can give you up at, at full load, this guy can give you up to 15 seconds of uh, voltage sag right through, interruption right through, because it's, it's storing that energy in ultra capacitors, uh, high, energy, high energy density capacitors. Um, so that's another way to get additional ride through on the 24 volts. Another method that you can utilize is to, utilize, is to use sag tolerant components, voltage sag tolerant components in the, on the AC side. Now we've done a lot of testing over the years, other labs have as well, where um, We've certified a lot of equipment to semi F47. That is a voltage sag immunity standard that basically says we're going to ride through down to about 50% of nominal for about 12 cycles, 70% of nominal for about a half second, and 80% of nominal for a second. And if that component can do that or that drive can do that, 
then it's going to be able to be certified for semi F47. There's a lot of control components. If you search semi F47 relays, semi F47 contactor, semi F47 power supply, there's a lot that's out there on the uh, on the web that you're going to find. Uh, this is semi F47 has been in place since about 1999, so this is you know we're going getting close to 20 years here very short, shortly on this. Um, so there's a lot of sag tolerant components. So putting one of those in a circuit like this, instead of putting something sensitive like an ice cube relay, is one way to, to make it better. A couple of years back, my colleagues and I started thinking about a problem that we'd seen for a long time. We just saw these ice cube relays everywhere in plants. And so one of the things that we, we thought about was, wouldn't it just be great if we had a, a more robust AC ice cube relay? I mean, that would solve so many, so many problems if we could just pull out the old relay and stick in a new one. And so we thought about it, we prototyped it, we got a manufacturer to build it, and we said, here, we're going to free license it to you. We don't want any royalties. Don't get a dime off this. We didn't even patent it. Okay. You may think I'm an idiot, but we didn't patent it. Um, but we exist for the public good, and this is one of the things that we, we thought was really important to do. So we came up with a, re, uh, a new concept called the Nice Cube, and it's a play on words. The nice cube relay is an ice cube relay that plays nicely with the power quality. Okay? <laughs> and so what you do is you take your existing AC ice cube relay, you unplug it out of the socket, and then you just stick in this little assembly right in that same socket. I had, don't have to do any wiring. If, if it's a double pole, double throw, it's a direct connection. There's nothing that you have to do. If it's three pole or four pole, uh, you, if you're using all those poles, then you'll have to maybe put two of these in, side by side to get the same function. Um, but these guys are about $85 per unit. And I'll pass these around. You all can look at them. Um, these are uh, supplied by Power Quality Solutions Incorporated. So I'll, I'm going to give you a little demo of that, of the Nice Cube. And so I have one up here. I want to unplug some other things for a second. So now I'm just going to put my Nice Cube relay into this little socket right here. Okay. So he's energized, and we're going to do a few little sag tests just to show you how well you can ride through with a nice cube relay. So we know that the, uh, the AC ice cube relays were dropping out around 70% of nominal. So here's a 70% of nominal voltage sag. Let's say it's five cycles long. And uh, what you're going to see here, uh, the voltage sag goes through, make sure I'm actually monitoring the nice cube relay channel. Should be. Okay, it goes through the ice cube relay and comes back. It doesn't drop out. I may have to listen for the click because I'm not sure I've got the channel actually monitored. Go back here for a second. All right, so um, it didn't trip then. Okay, so we, what you're seeing is the voltage go through the AC contact, the contacts on the relay, so it just looks like a, you see the reduced voltage. When it actually opens, you're going to see a discontinuity in that waveform. I'm going to go down to about 50% of nominal for five cycles. It didn't trip. I'm going to go to 40% of nominal for five cycles. It didn't trip the relay. Here's 30%. about 25, I expect it to trip somewhere near, there it goes. So what you see is the relay eventually tripped, okay? The voltage is going through it and then it opened during this time. That went from, by just doing, think about this, pulling out this relay out of a socket and putting this directly in takes a few seconds of machine downtime. If that's a sensitive relay in, in, the, in a spot that I've talked about that can make your system shut down, there's no wiring required. You can make a difference from shutting down at 70 something percent to 25 percent of nominal, just like that. That's pretty huge. And that's, why is that happening? Why is it so much easier? What am I doing? And what am I doing here to make that happen? Well, it's very simple. We're going from AC to DC. In AC, what's happening to the magnetic field 120 times a second? It's flipping, polarity, back and forth. And when it does that, the, the, the uh, ma amount of magnetics to hold in the contactor reduces and comes back. So it's always fluctuating like this. When you stay on the DC side, it's, it stays on the same direction and it doesn't collapse every 120 times a second. It doesn't collapse. 
So you're able to go to a much lower level before that magnetic field gets to a point where the relay will open. And that's why the DC makes a big difference. So we're basically taking out an AC relay, putting in a rectifier basically in a DC relay. And so you get the relay and the rectifier as one unit for about 85 bucks. This is what you see. Here's our old uh, ride through curve with a, a typical AC ice cube. Here's the nice cube. Uh, it's been UL and CS, uh, CE certified, so I wouldn't think it would be any different than a typical AC ice cube relay from a, a, a relay from a life cycle standpoint. It all depends on how many operations. What are you using it for? In most cases, for um, if you if you got a relay that you're clicky click 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 constantly like this to do something, then uh, it's probably not. You know, it's really for the things where if I'm talking to a drive to tell the drive to run or some other subsystem or if I'm using it for an emergency off or something of that nature. It's a, or a, a pilot for a big contact or emergency off, it's a good, um, a good application. But it could work in a, in a fast changing um, uh, output as well. But the difference is huge here between the number of shutdowns that you would see. And it costs about 85 bucks. And there are 24 volt AC solutions and 120 volt AC solutions. So, if, you're, if you've got building management systems with AC relays, 24 volt AC ice cubes, building uh, um, automation systems, this can work in there. Uh, a lot of the semiconductor realm has 24 volt uh, AC controls. I just recently uh, helped a major, um, I won't say which major, there's only really one major New York manufacturer of, uh, of semiconductors now, but uh, find places about uh, 80 different control panels where they had stuck in 24 volt AC ice cube relays. We were able to help them and show them with this simple retrofit they could fix that problem. So, um, so I demonstrated the nice cube. Another thing, that you, here's an example contactor. Now this contactor rides through down to about 30% nominal. This is a large 150 amp contactor. How do you think it's riding through that low of a voltage sag? This is an AC contactor riding through a voltage sag that low. Any ideas on how it does it? If you, when you connect to that contactor, inside that contactor, it converts it from AC to DC and has a DC coil in there. So it's doing the same exact thing, but in, built into the contactor itself. And we're not talking about adding capacitors and all kinds of stuff like that to make things hold in. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about inside of an AC system. We're talking about rectifying it and keeping it on, making it a DC thing. So when you put these systems together and you start looking at how they perform as a whole, if you have a, a little relay that drives a motor starter, like this CR relay, if that CR relay is not very good with respect to voltage sags, then in this whole entire system will be not very good. But if that relay is, is compliant to, to standards like semi F47 and the motor starter is too, the overall response of the system should be good and be robust to voltage sags. How many of you guys program PLCs? Okay. One of the things that you'll do when you do that is if you've got a flow switch or, a, uh, or if you've got a level switch or something in a tank or a pressure switch, you don't always make that PLC react to the very first time it sees that change because things can bounce right when they're at the edge of a particular flow or when they're right at the edge of a particular level. So you put a little delay timer in there. Same thing can be done for motor starters. You can do the same thing for, uh, and it depends on the application, of course, but for pump and fan applications or direct online starters, adding a delay timer such that when the auxiliary contact opens, if you give it a little bit of time before you take away the signal that's trying to start that, con you, know, you hold that output on that says run, Mr. Motor, right? And you look at that auxiliary contact that comes back and says, hey, it's pulled in. And if you see that that auxiliary contact opens, delay it a little bit before you drop that output and that can actually help you ride through voltage sags um, which is an interesting thing especially a lot of times the motor starter coil may be in a motor control uh, center bucket and you may not have the ability to put a, a power conditioner in there you have to think about this based on what kind of application i would not do this on anything with a compressor have a high torque load or something like that where if you're slamming in and out if the motor starter opened and closed or chattered it might cause a, a the back EMF and the supply voltage to get out of sync so far that you might have a big torque transient. So you don't want to do that on those types of loads. Another thing you can do is state machine programming. 
Uh, what, um, how many of you know what I'm talking about when I say volatile versus non-volatile memory? Okay, I feel like I've got a lot of volatile memory these days. I don't remember what I did five minutes ago, right? But non-volatile memory means I don't forget if you turn the power off of the system or if it shuts down and comes back up, it remembers what was in that register. So what, was, what state the machine was in. So when the power comes back up, oh, I was in step five, that means I'm supposed to be mixing and heating to temperature so I can pick back up again. If you, use, uh, if you don't use that type of, of uh, approach inside of a PLC program, a lot of times you lose, if you lose power completely and come back up, your process may have no idea what step it's in. And if that's the case, uh-oh. You know, I, I was involved with, I worked on a project for Kaiser Aluminum in West Africa in the early 90s, and I didn't know about this. And um, well, they had reliability issues. And so we had 10 mixers we were feeding from a batching system and on a green carbon plant. And every time there was a reliability issue, if the lights blinked, um, the PLC would forget what step. Each of those 10 mixers had different steps. But I was latching that information in in a way not using, I was using volatile memory instead of non-volatile memory. And so I spent about an extra couple weeks in, in West Africa because of that. Okay, another thing that you can do is you can uh, use a voltage sensing relay. There are things like, uh, simple things you can use is a phase monitoring relay. A phase monitoring relay can actually detect if there's a voltage sag and you can send that to your, to your uh, control system and say, hey, something's happened here, do something differently. If you wanted to try to do a controlled shutdown or uh, hold a process variable, or control variable that you're controlling a loop with, you could do that. Another thing is the uh, PQ monitor relay or the PQ relay. This is a relay that allows you to uh, uh, sense that there's a voltage sag that's happened under certain standard levels. So you could set it for semi F47 or the ITIC curve or different curves. And if, it dro if the voltage drops below that, it's gonna send you a contact closure that you could measure with your control system. So you could know whether you were above or below, very simply, uh, a voltage sag on that particular phase. And the third thing I've seen people use is AC ice cube relays because they're so sensitive. In fact, we did the uh, Owens, Illinois uh, Rolling Rock, um, Rolling Rock uh, uh, beer bottle plant in Pennsylvania if you, for, for one of the uh, first energy companies a few years ago. Well, you were with me, right? Bosker and I went and did that one. And uh, one of the neat things about that is they have a glass machine. And at this glass machine, they're, they're pushing glass down through uh, to each of these molten glass from a furnace down to these each individual glass forming things. And uh, if there's a problem with the voltage or voltage sag, they want to stop sending the, the glass down because it'll get all solidified and gunked up in the machine. So they use three different AC ice cube relays with three control power transformers wired phase to phase and running a signal through all those relays on the normally open contacts. And they could monitor, they could use that then to stop that dropping those globs of glass down. So they use the AC ice cube relays to, uh, to actually, uh, to their benefit in that case. So one thing that you can also do is look at configuration settings. How do I set things up to make them ride through voltage sags? And so drives these days have a lot of setting parameters that you can look at. So if I'm gonna harden a typical control system, there's two things I look at. Control, if, I'm, if you're going in a plant that's got existing systems, you're not gonna be able to slam DC on everything because you got sensors and everything that's designed for AC. It's not gonna happen. So you want to put power conditioning, which we're going to talk about in a minute, on the control voltage. And you also want to make sure those drives are set up so they can try to ride through the voltage sags. And so there's a lot of parameters now from automatic restart, automatic reset, um, automa the time delay between restarts, uh, flying restart, catching a motor while it's spinning type of approach. Um, there's also kinetic buffering, which allows the motor to slow down a little bit so that it keeps the DC bus of the drive up to a level that will allow it to ride through. Uh, and there's several other parameters that you can look at. Input phase loss, input phase loss delay, um, and DC bus under voltage detection limits. These parameters can be adjusted. Unfortunately, there's no standardized set of terminology between the drive manufacturers. So you have to look at each individual book and try to understand it. And it can be sometimes, um, uh, it can say some funny things uh, uh, depending on what the, uh, uh, when you're trying to understand what the, uh, the parameter actually means. But these things uh, are available. And uh, if you go to a website, I'm going to tell you about uh, called mypq, mypq.epri.com. mypq.epri.com. This looks like mypq.epri.com. 
www.ghostbusters.com. You can watch some videos on the front of that page. One of those is about how to adjust the set points of a drive to make it ride through voltage sags. And it gives a good demo with a real system. So you can see the system uh, riding through um, uh, as a result of, of parameter changes. <clears throat> Here's an example of, of, a, of a Rockwell drive. We've done a lot of testing for Rockwell over the years. Um, this is the PowerFlex 70 and 700 series. We've also done the 753s, 755s, all of those tests. These drives have built-in parameters that can improve voltage sag performances, even if the drive is loaded to 100%. Um, they have a couple of different parameters in that drive. One's called the D-cell mode, and one's called the continue mode. D-cell means it's basically doing kinetic buffering. It's going to allow, uh, it's going to try to let the motor slow down a little bit to keep the DC bus up. And the continue mode is basically going to try to keep the speed of the motor about the same maybe draw a little more current during that time frame as well. But the DC bus voltage is gonna drop during that time frame. So this is an example of a voltage sag test and what we're looking at, think of an oscilloscope. This is uh, voltage A, B, and C uh, with respect to neutral in this test. But this shows me I've got a voltage A to B sag of 50% of nominal. In this test, I didn't have a line reactor and I set it the parameter 184 for D cell and I did the worst case set point for semi F47, which is 12 cycles, 50% of nominal. And what happened was, the voltage, uh, the, the speed of the drive goes down, but it recovers and comes out. So it did not shut down the drive. Now, in order to do that, I gotta make sure my controls are hardened as well. So you can set your drive parameters all day long, but if you don't take care of the AC ice cubes or the AC controls around this thing, your drive's gonna shut off because of that, like I showed you earlier, right? Now this is set to D cell. And this is interesting, here's the voltage sag. We got a little crunched up time period here. But notice there's barely a deviation in the speed at all in the, in the, uh, in the continue mode. And what they recommend though with the continue mode, Alan Bradley will recommend that you put a line reactor up front. And the reason for that is it starves the capacitor a little bit at the end of the sag so that the capacitor cannot charge uh, really quickly. And if it can't charge really quickly, it keeps you from tripping on overcurrent on the drive. So another good reason to have chokes on the front end of your drive, at least a 3% choke. For, uh, these things can keep you from tripping on uh, capacitor switching transient, ringing voltages that can happen on the system. And they also can cut down the, uh, um, the amount of harmonics that come back on your system. And they can help you from tr keep from tripping on overcurrent after a voltage sag. So another thing you can do is select appropriate trip curves for circuit breakers. Sometimes when, um, when you have a, um, you let a system ride through voltage sags, we've seen this on certain OEM equipment we've tested, because it's now riding through voltage sags and things like power supplies, for instance, had a big three phase power supply we're working on with a semiconductor manufacturer. It was able to ride through the sag, but the bus level would go down a little bit. At the end of the sag then, you wanted to charge those capacitors back up. So in this case, we couldn't put an inductor in front, but we could change the trip curve of the, of the circuit breaker by putting a different circuit breaker in that had a, a delayed trip curve. Now I want to bring your attention to this. This says P1668 up here. This is a, a voltage sag recommended practice that you should know about. Uh, it's actually IEEE 1668 now. It's a trial use recommended practice. It was released last year. We expect it next year to actually be uh, a, a recommended practice in, in, uh, um, for my IEEE. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to work on the group that helped to develop this. And this practice is built around semi F47, which is really a semiconductor specific standard. This is a standard, this is a recommended practice that you as a general industrial manufacturer could utilize to say, OEM, I want you to meet this. And this practice not only talks about um, what voltage sag levels you should meet, it also tells you um, how to do the testing and specific, specifics on considerations, and it has a great primer on voltage sags and why they occur. One of the things it defines is, the same way semi F47 defines these, is full normal operation, self-recovery, and assisted recovery. Full normal operation means that that machine or process needs to recover without getting the process or the, or the product out of spec, okay, with no intervention from anybody. It's gonna be able to handle down to the voltage sag test levels without being upset. Uh, Self-recovery means that it's going to be able to ride through that event, but I might, you know, I might have some variation in process parameters during that time frame, but it's, it's going to come out of it without shutting anything down. And then assisted recovery says, okay, 
I just don't want it to kill itself or blow something up or something, but I want, it, I want to be able to go and just restart it or assist it and help it come back up in a smooth way. Now normally if you're specking relays and contactors and things like that, you want things like that to be full normal operation. You don't want your contactor to chatter during the voltage sags down to the standard. Uh, many drives, however, uh, many of the drives can do self-recovery or uh, depending on how deep the, the voltage sag uh, actually takes the speed down. It just depends on the drive settings as well. Here is a, uh, the, the standard itself for single phase, and it's 50% it's nominal for 200 milliseconds, which is 12 cycles, 70% nominal for um, 30 cycles, and it's or, or a half second, and uh, it's also 80% nominal for two seconds. And this is the single and, and two phase, uh, single and two and three phase requirements. Uh, type one is single phase, type two is two phase, and type three is three phase. And so what we're seeing here is 80% anomaly for two seconds. It's the same exact curve here for type one and type two as it is for single phase. Okay? And type three has an additional requirement for three phase, which has never been done before in any of the IEC standards or the semi F47 standards. We know from the chart that Mark put up here earlier that up to about 20% of the voltage sags can actually be three phase, where the three phases go down below a certain level. And so this standard allows you to specify you'd like to have it tested that way and also what the pass fail criteria uh, was for that equipment. So other considerations. Make sure the device rated voltage matches the nominal voltage. Consider subsystem performance, vendor subsystems, um, need to be considered if you buy something and stick it in on a system, you've got to make sure that it's robust and doesn't cause the things to shut down. You also want to consolidate control power sources and use targeted battery, uh, use targeted voltage conditioning approaches where possible, which is what we're going to talk about next. Now, why would I want to consolidate power sources? Just like the gentleman over here said, he's got a lot of consolidated control power sources. That helps me a lot when I want to put in power conditioning because I don't have to worry about so many touch points. Some of you, you're going to be living with what you got, but if you think about what you're going to do in the future, this may help you if you're going to design something new. But let's start out now, and let's start talking about embedded solutions through targeted power conditioning. Now, if we think about the cost of solutions, and we're looking at these things, I can replace a relay uh, for $25 maybe with a more robust relay, or I can use what's called a coil lock. It's another type of ride-through device for a relay. It's about $130, or I could use a nice cube that's $85. If I want to condition that control level, I might use a small power conditioner that's $1,500 to $3,000. If I want to do it for an entire machine, it's going to get more expensive. So the coverage gets better as you go up, but the amount of cost goes way up as you move up that power chain. So there are many different power quality mitigation devices that you could choose. Here's some examples of them. We do not have any financial interest in any of this. In other words, we're not, we don't hawk anything, we're not trying to sell anything. And so one of the things that we are is unbiased. We're gonna tell you the good and bad of all these things. Each one of them has positives and negatives. But um, we've tested all this stuff that I'm gonna show you. And we, we, for many years now, all this equipment, none of these things that we're gonna show you is brand new things that have just come out and haven't been proven. All of this has been proven in an industrial setting for 10, 15 years at least, some going on 20. Okay, some of them like the constant voltage transformer has been around for ages. So we'll talk about these three phase applications a little bit later. I'm gonna show the Pro Disc and the Omniverter AVC and talk about those. Um, I'm gonna focus on the mini disc, the CVT, the voltage dip compensator. We're also gonna talk about the voltage dip proofing inverter and um, we'll talk about some, maybe a supercapacitor UPS as well. So what is the thought behind this type of approach. Well, not all the equipment power users are ultra sensitive. So we don't necessarily need to hold a three phase motor up to a voltage sag, but we sure better keep the controls in. Um, these are weak links that are typically single phase. and This is much lower cost than the macro level solutions. I'm sorry if there's anybody in here that's a UPS vendor or sells UPSs. I'm not trying to knock UPSs, uh, battery based UPSs. Um, but I'm telling you that if you stick a bunch of battery-based UPSs inside your controls, inside control cabinets, throughout the facility, you will have a maintenance problem. Every three years or so, those batteries are going to be bad. You've got to replace them, and you're going to have a dead UPS. I bet if I ask you, I don't know if anybody would actually raise their hand, but some of you already have dead UPSs sitting in your factory uh, that you bypass now. 
I know that because I see them about every plan I go into. Or maybe you don't realize it's dead, but I can show you it's not working right. Um, so, UPSs, um, you've got to be very careful in the application of them. And if you're going to use a UPS system, I would much rather you use a distributed power UPS system. Use a, like we talked about, a centralized power panel that has UPS power in it and distribute that around to everybody that needs it, rather than sticking a bunch of small ones all throughout the plant. It's a much better idea. It's much easier to manage over the long term. When you look at UPSs, one of the quagmires you get into is people try to utilize UPSs that are designed for PCs and stick them in control panels. These are offline units. They don't switch fast enough for relays and PLCs to ride through most of the time. If you have a deep voltage sag below 50%, they may switch in a cycle. But if you have a minor voltage sag around 70%, that little offline UPS could take three or four cycles to figure that out. It's way past the time for the relay or contactor. It's already tripped. Okay, so uh, there are also DC UPSs for the 24 volts DC. I don't personally like these. I've only seen these in some applications. I went down to a Gestomp plant in South Carolina working on PQ there. And what I saw on those was uh, red lights on the UPS batteries that were dead. You know, same thing, you're just putting it on 24 volts to deal with a battery issue versus 120. There are supercapacitor-based UPSs now that can give you ride-through uh, up to 15, 15 seconds to 45 seconds, depending on the loading. So you get right, and this is a data set, just an example data set. So I can go a long time and ride through a voltage sag or an interruption with a uh, ultra capacitor based system. So I'm not using a battery, and so it's just it's a capacitor. It gives me much um, uh, a longer lifetime than dealing with batteries. This is a three kVA unit, it's about three thousand dollars for that unit. Another thing we can use is a constant voltage transformer. This guy's been around forever. You guys, how many of you guys have CVTs in your plants? Okay, you're making some good choices there, and uh, CVTs are important. Want to understand, we want to look at how you've employed, how you're utilizing them, because I want to um, show you an example of it. CVTs operate by taking the primary uh, voltage, comes in, and it's basically wound in a way that it's a saturated core. So you have a saturated um, core in the transformer, and you have a resonant circuit on the secondary that basically modulates at the level that you want to accomplish or that you want, whether it's a 50 hertz or 60 hertz, depending on where your plant's at. So, CVTs are great in some aspects that they can be utilized to, uh, they can be utilized to, um, as a step-down transformer. Like, you can go in from one side 480 and you come out the other side 120. Um, so you can get rid of your existing CPT if you'd like. So, these are online devices, however. So these devices have to be carefully sized. You can't just go look at your control power transformer and think I can slap in the exact same con uh, constant voltage transformer size and everything's gonna be fine because you have to take in consideration the inrush characteristics of the load. So you need to refer to the CBT manufacturer specifications and uh, you need to measure the inrush correctly because if you don't, like, for just a general rule of thumb, don't try to put one of these things into where you're trying to start a large starter. Uh, without sizing it properly. You have to be careful because that inrush current will basically uh, can make the output of the CVT collapse if it, if it sees too much inrush. So you've got to size it maybe around four times the rated size of the, uh, if you're pulling in a big load. Um, you, we've got actually some um, application notes on how to do this and you'll find that as well in, in other literature. But you need to oversize it by a factor of two typically to get voltage sag ride through. So if I've got a PLC and just AC ice cubes and some power supplies in a cabinet, I can put a CVT on there usually and not worry about inrush so much if I at least oversize it by a factor of two. So I may look, I can measure how much load I got or I can just take that CPT and double it and put it on there. And I, usually I'm pretty good with that. Um, this thing acts as an isolation transformer. We have hit them with like 3000 volts lightning strike simulations on one end. They do a great job of mitigating that. They, they isolate very well from uh, noise or transients. Now, the minimum size, two to two and a half times the nominal VA or half the max inrush current. Um, 
If I go up to a panel and I've got a 500 VA control power transformer or 500 VA load, I need a 1 kVA CVT ballpark to help me out and make that control system ride through. However, that's going to weigh 62 pounds at 1 kVA. This is a 250 VA one up here. This little thing weighs 27 pounds. It's a small little box right here. And it's hot. It's going to probably be, you know, 80% efficient maybe, about that other 20 or so. It's going to burn my hand if I keep it on there long enough. It puts out heat. So you never put them inside the control panels. You always see them outside, typically on top or under the bottom of the control panel or something because they run warm. So let's look at what it's going to do for us. So here's our, um, here's our 50, here's a 50% 50 of nominal voltage sag, let's say five cycles. And I've switched the PLC back to the most sensitive state again. So here's my sag generator output, and you can see the CVT has corrected it. Now, notice the first couple of cycles were a little bit lower. It's just taking a little time for the magnetics to you know, settle in, but if I go up to 60 or 70%, it's gonna look a little bit different. It's going to do a little better regulating at the front end, but eventually, if I get down too low, like about here's around 45 percent of nominal, I could ride through 50 percent on this system. Here's 45. I tripped, so I wasn't able to. Uh, and what happened here is the voltage dropped below this voltage here dropped below the threshold level of that AC input car, AC input power supply, and it told the system to shut down. So I'm, if I double size it, I'm normally going to get around two times the ride through, uh, two, uh, excuse me, around 50% of nominal for the ride through. Um, and so what am I gonna pay for this thing? I've got this 500 VA load, I need a 1K VA unit, I'm gonna pay somewhere from 13 to 12 or $1,300 for it, for that. Now I'm gonna get, like this is my 45%, I can, this typical little control system can ride through down to about 45% of nominal. I can't ride through interruptions, I don't have stored energy in here. I've got a, uh, a saturated core transformer. So anything below that, it's going to trip. But it gets me through a lot of stuff. If you size this thing one to one for your load, like you, and it can, you know, your inrush isn't an issue, but maybe it's, a, if I put a 500 VA in for a 500 VA load, what's going to happen is this line's going to be up here around 80%. It's not going to do nearly as well. So you don't want to, in order to get right through, you've got to oversize it. That's just the, Okay, another thing I want to demonstrate is the dip proofing inverter. This device, instead of using magnetics, it uses capacitors to help it ride through and to uh, make the system ride through voltage sags. So this device has been around for a long time. It uses capacitors internally and uh, it's fairly lightweight. And um, the way it works is you have uh, three connections. We have a connection to a static switch that comes in on this side. We have a connection to neutral, and we have a connection to the output. You'll notice internally it's got capacitors, and it's also got some dip switches. Those dip switches let me set how long I want it to ride through and at what level I want it to transfer. So let's look at its um, performance. And so I'm going to show you, here's a five cycle sag at, uh, 45% of nominal. Now the CVT couldn't handle this. But this, this system didn't shut down when I just did this, see? So here's my PLC voltage. Notice what the PLC is seeing, or what's being corrected, is this, is, uh, this square wave. So it's making a square wave output during the voltage sag. At the end of the sag, it switches back. All right, I wanna go all the way down to zero volts now. This thing does not care whether it's a sag or an interruption. It's gonna, once it clicks in and starts working, it's just gonna work until the sag or interruption's over as long as it can. And so I can do an interruption now. And here's my five cycle interruption. Don't expect it to trip, there we go. I got plenty of energy here. Here's a 20 cycle interruption. Nothing's tripped. Now notice this is starting to head downhill. We're having a decay in the capacitor voltage over time. Here's a 30 cycle interruption. Uh, 
40 cycles. Okay, in this particular case, with this particular loading level, I got down to a level within 40 cycles where I tr the input voltage was low enough to make the PLC shut down again. Okay, so what are the things I need to worry about when I think about ride through with one of these devices? <clears throat> one thing is loading. In order to size a, con a dip proofing inverter properly, you have to know how many watts that you have as a load. And so in this case, uh, this 250 V, uh, I think I've got a 500 VA unit. I'm sorry, I've got a 250 VA unit. It's got 45 joules of usable energy in it. 45 joules, a joule is a watt second. So if I, have, if I, I can calculate my ride through time by the stored energy in watt seconds divided by the load in watts. So I need to measure the load accurately in watts to understand how much load actually is, not just VA, or, or amps and volts, I need to know the watts, right? And so if I take this, uh, an example here, a 500 VA unit has 90 joules or 90 watt seconds. If my circuit load was 45 watts, 90 divided by 45 basically says I can get two seconds out of it, okay? It's a square wave. There's a few PLC brands that are not compatible with square waves. Most all of the Allen Bradley stuff I've tested is fine with it. And it has to do with the way the AC input card um, determines what's a one and what's a zero. I've seen some PLCs where the AC input card would think a square wave is a zero suddenly, okay, and thinks all the inputs are dead. Um, again, the, the Allen Bradley stuff has been fine. The coverage is all the way down to an interruption. So in this data set, it's, this squashes, this is a semi F47 curve, it's much better than that goes all the way down to zero volts once, uh, give you, and gives you ride through. The cost of these things can vary. You're looking at uh, a 250 VA model um, that I've got up here is about $1,400. You know, so you can see the price going up from there. They can get fairly big, 25 and 50 amp units as well. This device looks similar to the other one because they're made by the same company. This is called a voltage dip compensator. The voltage dip compensator does something totally different, however. This was really designed, uh, and the semiconductor industry has used it quite a bit. Um, it was designed to help things ride through semi F47, but instead of using stored energy and capacitors, it has a static, a series of static switches on the primary side of the, of the transformer. And what it does is it steps up and down on those static switches based on the voltage that it sees. And it just automatically corrects for um, the, the voltage sag. I like this device for a couple of reasons. This is the one KVA unit right here. This is one KVA, okay? So that's, this is a 250 VA constant voltage transformer. It weighs 27 pounds. It's hot, it's putting out a lot of energy. This is a, the VDC is at one KVA. This thing runs cool, why? Because it, it's just, it's not using a saturated core to do what it needs to do. But it taps up and down. Um, and it puts out a sine wave. It does, unlike the dip proofing converter, you're just tapping up and down on the AC coming in with that transformer and it's putting in a sine wave. The coverage goes down to about 50% of nominal um, and it'll go for several seconds. And this shows you the data set that it will cover. So I'll just show you a quick example of it. So now we're down to I couldn't make it ride through zero volts. I can't tap up from zero, right? So I'm going to put about 50% of nominal here, and here's my 40 cycle sag I just did. And I just did it with the VDC, and it rode through just fine. There's no decaying going on in the output of it, um, and it continues to ride through just fine. So um, it all looks good. But if I get lower, eventually it's going, it can't tap up far enough at one level. It won't be able to tap up far enough. Let me make this a little shorter in order to make the uh, PLC ride through. Like if I go to here 40% of nominal, probably not gonna be able to make it. So there, it, the dro voltage dropped, it couldn't tap up all the way. The voltage dropped to a level that was below the threshold of the power supply. So again, it, it, um, it rode through down to that point. Okay. Pricing, uh, one KVA unit is about $1,700. You don't have to oversize this by factor two or anything like that either. Um, if I'm going to put power conditioning on things that have compressors, whether that's a chiller, whether that's an air compressor, 
then a lot of times I'll, this, I would like to use two different things, either a constant voltage transformer, if you size it correctly, or a VDC. And why is that? I don't want the scenario where I hold in the voltage to the controls of a, one of these compressor systems, because if I do, and if I hold it in for an interruption, and we own that circuit that gets interrupted, and the power comes back, and because of my high torque and that load, my back EMF and my supply voltage is way out of sync. When that, if they come back out of sync because of an interruption and the voltage comes back, you can have a torque transit. And that torque transit can break shafts and things of that nature. So when you're doing voltage sag ride through on compressors, think about something like this that, on that circuit that would make it ride through down to maybe 50%, but not down to zero. Because Again, if you're on that faulted phase that has the, that you actually open that, the breaker opens and then comes back on you, um, you could get a back EMF that's out of sync with the supply voltage and you're going to have a torque transient, a big current and rush torque transient problem. Not so much of an issue with other types of, other types of control, other types of loads. Dynamic SAG corrector. This is a company that was started uh, in Mech, uh, Mech one, or no, uh, we're at in, in Wisconsin, can't remember, that. maybe it was Mequon. Um, but they are, um, they've been around for a long time. I know the guys personally have started the company. This, this series is something called series injection technology. And series injection technology draws a little more current from the load, I mean from the source, and uh, replaces the missing voltage during a voltage sag. This is some great technology. And it's, uh, it was actually comes from something EPRI, we did at EPRI back in the 90s to pioneer this particular approach. And this is, uh, we did it on a large scale, like a whole plant level, looking at that type of solution. These guys decided to take it to many different levels, down from control level all the way up to 480 volts, you know, from KVA to MVA levels. And so what it does is, uh, there are different sizes of this guy. I'm gonna demonstrate the mini disc, one of the mini disc products. It's a single phase device. They also have three phase uh, devices as well. But here's your input voltage. It, figures out the missing volts and rebuilds it and adds those two together basically and, and corrects the output voltage. So this guy will ride through voltage sags down to about 50% of nominal, it's gonna pull a little extra current. Below 50% of nominal, it's going to get energy out of the capacitors that are internal, okay? And so that's the approach that it normally uses. Uh, you can buy an extended outage unit and you can even get more ride through time. So this, the extended outage at full load would give you about 200 milliseconds or 12 cycles of ride through. Okay, so this is what this looks like on the, uh, the typical coverage of, here's our just little graph I've showed you before with the data set, semi F47 shown here. Here's the uh, mini disc, the standard curve for the mini disc, and here's the, uh, the blue curve is the extended curve for the extended ride through, it just has additional capacitors in it. If it's lightly loaded or under loaded, these curves shift to the right. So it gives you voltage sag or interruption ride through. I worked with uh, GM at one of their plants in a paint booth and one of the things they wanted to do, they had a 12 amp circuit and they said, we want a 50 amp uh, mini disc on there. And we did that and we got over two seconds of ride through because it was way under loaded, worked great in the application, but they didn't need battery storage at all and they could get up to two seconds of, of uh, ride through out of it. These are some of the costs. Now Rockwell bought, uh, soft switching, which just basically means the price goes up, if any of you guys know Rockwell. So those guys are great, but they make, and they do a good job of distributing things, but the price goes up typically. Uh, so um, uh, probably one of the common ones I see a lot is the 1.5 kVA unit or so, the 120 12 amp, 1.4, 1.5 amp, that's about $2,300 list. All of you guys will have a multiplier based on your, whatever they deem you um, worthy of. Another type of device is a coil hold-in device that go in front of relays and contactors. And that device is actually uh, able to uh, um, go right in front of a relay or a contactor that might be really uh, important, that it doesn't drop out during a voltage sag. These are about $130 per unit. And this is kind of what the ride-through curve looks like. Guess what this thing does? It takes AC, it converts it to basically an alternating signal that never crosses zero volts. So if you've got zero here, it's gonna go like this on the output basically of this thing and never go below zero again. So it doesn't flip the magnetic field upside down again each time. 
but it gives you an average DC voltage on the magnetic, on the coil. Uh, these again have been around for 15 years or more, 20 years, and uh, very common technology. You can utilize them, they're really good in motor control center applications, because in a little bucket, you have your own little control power transformer. You can't stick in many times one of these big power conditioners I'm talking about. But if you have a really critical motor starter, you can put this on that motor starter and make it ride through voltage sags to around 25% around of nominal. It's sized based on the resistance of the coil and the voltage. And the manufacturer can work with you to make sure that you size it right for the contactor that you have that you want to prop up. Again, the prices, the no-trip models are uh, not, you don't see them. I rarely see these spec. Uh, they're more expensive and they're, diff they're not nearly as nice from a packaging standpoint. This is the, uh, the coil lock, which looks kind of like a relay uh, as, as far as the form factor. It has a DIN, the DIN rail mounting. About $120 to $130 per unit. Okay, so these are some of the examples that you can utilize. Uh, and I didn't show, did I not show you this? I didn't show you the, this last one. I don't know why. How did I go over that without actually doing it? I don't know. This is a dynamic sag corrector, which um, I'll show you a quick example of. Once the system powers back up again. And so uh, the dynamic sag corrector, here's my 50% uh, nominal voltage sag. And uh, here's my input voltage to the sag corrector. Here's the output voltage it, it, it puts out. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go all the way down to zero volts, 10 cycles. This is a, uh, a six amp unit I've got here. So that's uh, zero volts and it rides through all the way to zero. At that level, it's pulling uh, stuff out of the capacitor, energy out of the capacitor. There's a 20 cycle interruption. Here's a 30 cycle. Fifty cycle. It's doing a good job. Now see this decay? What's happening here? The DC the, the voltage on the DC capacitors in there is decaying. That's why it keeps moving further south and gets smaller. So eventually it's going to trip, but around sixty cycles or so it'll eventually give out and the input voltage won't be high enough to keep the PLC running. But again, that device has been used so we've seen so many customers utilize it. Um, Technology has been around a long time. All of these things are pretty well proven systems. Um, we don't show you things that we don't think that could actually solve problems uh, for you. So let's talk about now going up to machine and panel level solutions. What about if I'm backing up the power chain and I really can't, one of the reasons I, I might want to go up to this level is I can't fix it at the 480 volt level or the 120 volt level throughout my plant. Um, one of the reasons might be practicalities. I can't shut all these machines down or have the time to mess with 100 to 200 machines at that control, vo control voltage level. Now most customers don't go after that many machines. If they do even do it at the control voltage level, they tackle those ones that are the bottleneck processes that are sensitive, that mess with their flow of product and cause them a lot of money. Okay? So, but there are situations that arise that you may decide, hey, I need to put a power conditioner on this entire robot or this entire cell of manufacturing. I want to do that because of what my power quality data looks like. Maybe I'm at the end of that distribution line, which means you're going to have a lot of sensitivity if you've got a bunch of lateral feeds coming off that line. When you back up here, it gets more expensive. You get from, you know, looking from um, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. As you move up this power chain, it just gets more expensive to back up. And so we're going to talk about some, um, some technologies that can be used and that we've uh, utilize with customers for these different types of, uh, of applications. One is the Pro Disc or the Mega Disc, and that is really just the larger size mini disc. So now instead of a single phase mini disc, I have a three phase mini disc. These guys, um, uh, one of the things, uh, if you go and you, uh, you're, if you have a distribution panel that has a lot of, uh, of I.O. in that one distribution panel, or uh, it's got a um, where you may now be using a UPS or may have nothing on it. Oh, um, these, these types of devices can be really good in that application because a lot of times you may have a 480 to 208 volt step down transformer right above an instrument power panel. And so you take the 480 volt um, 
ProDisc, for instance, and you put it right above that instrument power panel on the, on the high side of that transformer, and then you can protect everything in that panel. And, um, and it's a really good way to do it. We've worked with Free Delay to do that in multiple plants because that's, that's just been a solution that, they, that works really well for them. Um, same, the same features I talked about uh, on the uh, mini disc or on this one. When you use this three phase device, make sure you spec it with a bypass. You just want to make sure in case this ever fails or needs maintenance, you can quickly get the system in your plant back up and running until you have an, uh, can get that fixed. Another type of device similar to that is called the Omniverter Active Voltage Conditioner. The big difference between this is that the base model of the AVC does not have stored energy. So it's a voltage sag ride through device. Well, the good thing about that is you can take back to back voltage sags and you can ride through back to back voltage sags very easily because you're not worrying about depleting some uh, um, energy that's stored internally because it's just drawing additional current from the line in order to make up the missing voltage. So this is what the uh, series injection technology typically looks like. You have your phase voltage coming in and you're also bringing that phase voltage here through this uh, rectifier supply uh, through a static switch and you're basically adding that missing voltage in here through a series injection uh, circuit. These guys also make their product to medium voltage levels which means you can do it at, you know, we've seen 1247, 345 applications of this technology. Very large applications. Some people have chosen to do it at the plant level, but it's expensive. Um, this is this, a sag in power conditioner um, ABC graph that just kind of shows how it's correcting. And this is a back-to-back -back voltage sag, happening almost immediately back-to-back. -back. And notice that it doesn't make any difference to this device because it's, it's, it doesn't have any stored energy that it's working with. It's just pulling more current from the line. So it works really well with back-to-back -back events. Again, this is the way I like to see it applied. I've worked, uh, there's six, uh, six of the, uh, the free-to-lay plants I've been in have been able to do it just like this. this. The first one that we ever did didn't use this technique, had a lot of 480 to 120 transformers, but six of the plants, we were able to go in and help them do this. They have a lot of these um, step-down transformers like this that, put, that feed the instrument power panel. This is for the potato chip line. And so we're able to put that right upstream and say you should stick a three-phase power conditioner, whether it's an AVC or a dynamic sag corrector, right upstream of this transformer. You have a simplified cutover. And if you do this uh, uh, distribution panel approach, this can be a real easy way to solve a lot of things at once. If you, uh, in one case, we actually measured the, the current on uh, phases A, B, and C to understand what the loading was prior. And, um, in some cases you can get even better than the specifications, especially on the dynamic sag corrector because the loading of that sag corrector uh, can gives you a varying amount of ride through at zero volts. So if I with the, loaded in the way we just showed it, I could ride through with this system um, all the way down to um, for single phase sags, I could ride through areas X, Y, and Z. Uh, for two phase sags, I could ride through areas X and Y. And for three phase sags, all the way down uh, to area X, um, so this is, that was a very uh, robust uh, solution for one particular site we're looking at here. Here's an example of the Omniverter ABC, and this one is the one that corrects back 40% uh, uh, correction. Basically, uh, for single and two-phase sags, it can correct down to about 25% back to a level in which the control shouldn't trip, and around 50% uh, three-phase. This guy can coverage for a long time, or the, this guy is kind of limited up to about five seconds. This one can go out to 30 seconds on coverage. Now, if you have a 30 second voltage sag at 50% anomaly, there's a real problem on the utility side. Okay. Hopefully, protection's taking things out at that point somewhere, but uh, that doesn't happen very often. On occasion, some weird things can happen, but that's a very rare event. Another type of technology that is batteryless is a flywheel. This is an active power flywheel, also rebranded as the Caterpillar UPS, and this device um, is really designed to work with a diesel genset um, so that, but you don't have to have a diesel genset to use it. I've had some customers that use it just as a, a, a voltage sag and interruption ride through. But in this case, uh, you're protecting your cr uh, critical load uh, using this flywheel. And here's an example of one. This is a, uh, about a 250 kilowatt, 300 kVA unit, and it cost about $100,000 to $140,000 for that unit. It's not cheap. Um, 
this is an example of the circuit that's internal, which I want to tell you a little bit more about it. You have a flywheel that's, that's uh, spinning at about 8,000 RPM. It's an 800 pound flywheel spinning at 8,000 RPM inside that box right there. Um, this is a bridge power application. And what it allows you to do is basically bridge the time before your generators start up. So those critical loads that you really need to make sure that you are on, that are on generator that are important, this keeps it, those loads from even ever shutting off. Um, so what this does in this situation, the, uh, normally the AC voltage comes, uh, the DC voltage comes in and um, the DC bus and it uh, keeps the flywheel running during the float. And I'm uh, um, oh, sorry, this is during, and during, excuse me, this is during float. We're taking this DC voltage, we're chopping it up to make AC, so we run the flywheel. And during the uh, discharge, we're taking that AC and we're rectifying it again to put the DC voltage uh, back on the UPS electronics, which then converts it back to AC, actually. There are different sizes of these. They go up actually to about uh, over a megawatt now in the family. Um, and you just add additional cabinetry. And the way that it works is you have your non-critical loads that you may need to power, and then you have your supercritical loads. And you just put this CAT UPS right in front of the critical loads so that it basically gives you the ride through until the, capacity, the uh, generator can start up. Uh, and it gives you some sort of uh, the bridging capability until that can start up. So you're, you can look at plus or minus 10% voltages as well, swings on the input. It'll control plus or minus 2% on the output. So it does a pretty good job of voltage regulation. Yes? Yes. Uh, this thing, it, it, will, it takes about 2,500 watts. Uh, the, the efficiency issue is around, um, the, the, at, at fully loaded, it's probably 96, 97% efficient. Lighter loaded, the worse that is, because it's, it's, it has an onboard vacuum pump that it has to keep running. And so that vacuum pump um, uh, is another 2,500 watts or so that's always uh, there. Versus like some of the other, there's a, there was, uh, Liebert had a flywheel unit, and I don't know if it's been rebranded again yet. Have you, but they, at one point they had a flywheel that was, um, where the, um, it ran at 50,000 RPM, or 50, 50 pound flywheel running at a faster RPM. And um, it was a, uh, a vacuum sealed at the factory. So it was vacuum sealed at the factory. So there was no vacuum pump associated with it. So it was more efficient. This is an example here where um, you can see we have a 10 second interruption. The voltage stays high there, stays at 480 but our percent of usable energy during that time decreases. However, we're able to recover um, during the voltage at the end and, and continue on. So I've seen it used for voltage sag ride through, um, as well as for um, basically generator startup and transfer. So this is an example. You asked this question a minute ago a little bit, but it gives you ride through for 10 or more seconds, depending on the loading. The flywheel standby power is 2,500 watts. The maintenance cost is about three to four years. You have about $6,000 per unit for bearing change maintenance cost. Um, so that's, uh, that's the basics behind it. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you a couple of case studies. Now, these are just to illustrate some points. Uh, the first case study I'm gonna show you, uh, you won't laugh at it too bad if I tell you it's from an old CRT manufacturer. <laughs> this was from Sony. And I actually did this job back in the late 90s, but it's a real good example of a concept we've talked about today. Uh, Sony was making displays for CRTs and in a manufacturing plant in San Diego. And so what we have here is different, various different manufacturing lines making different size displays. And what they found out was uh, they started tracking their losses. And this is over just about a two month period where they were having voltage sags. And they said, let's just try to understand what it's costing us. And they looked at it and said, okay, we had an event here. We, we had to reject certain amount of units for quality. They didn't work properly. They, weren't, they uh, didn't manufacture properly because of the voltage sag that happened during the manufacturing process. And then we had downtime of so many minutes. And because of that downtime, we weren't able to make X number of units. So looking at those two things gave them the idea of the total units missed that from either rejection or not being able to produce. And then they could hang a price on that and then kind of get an idea of what it cost them for each, uh, each event. Now, each of you have different metrics from what you would look at from what your cost of downtime is, but it's really important to try to get a handle on what your cost of downtime is. And if you're going to justify any solution from an engineering standpoint, you gotta know uh, 
and, and, and look at what your cost of downtime is. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a moment. This is the cumulative history of looking, uh, histogram looking at your voltage sags. And one of the things that we saw when I looked at that initially is that this is uh, at the 208 volt level, there were 85 events that were um, below, um, excuse me, 29 events in this uh, total time frame that were below 85% of nominal. 85 or below. And so these were, they were shutting down all, all the time and they were really being sensitive. Uh, and so, sorry, there was eight, in, the, in the bin between 80 and 85, there was 29 events. So they were getting shut down quite a bit with this particular facility, which was kind of interesting uh, because there wasn't really a lot of voltage, these aren't very deep voltage sags. So we started looking at it, and they had single, two, and three phase voltage sags at this site. Uh, various distribution of those sag events. But we looked at their equipment and we started trying to understand why it was sensitive. And one of the things that we saw was they used DCIO. They had a nice 24 volt DC power supply here feeding DCIO to the IO points. But they had a, they had a 208 volt circuit line feeding the PLCs. So the PLCs were AC powered at 208 volts. Now these are Omron PLCs. And uh, looking at that, um, we found out and we did some testing just how sensitive they were. They brought a bunch of the PLCs in, we set them up on the test bench, and we found out at 208 volts, some of these PLC models were dropping out at 85% of nominal, which was like a light bulb. Wow, that's why you're having all these issues, 85% of nominal. Why is that happening? Well, these PLCs were multi-ranging, and you had to set it for 100 to 120, or 200 to 240. If you hooked that PLC up at 120, it would ride through down to 67% of nominal, but if you hooked it up at 208, it would only ride through down to 85% of nominal. That's because it was on the lower range of that 200 to 240 volt level, which is counterintuitive to what I've kind of talked to you about today um, a little bit. So what did we tell them to do? Well, we realized that particular manufacturer also made 24 volt DC input power supplies for the PLC rack. So we told them, take the DC power supplies, take a DC power supply and, and put it inside the the slot of the rack, and then let's feed that with a 24 volt DC supply. And we actually told them about using a three phase 24 volt DC supply, and we did testing with that. Again, we're talking about AC versus DC input for PLCs. Again, there's a video on that website I talked about earlier about this concept that shows it even more. And we were able with that, uh, loading the power supply at various levels, at 60% loaded on the power supply, which you know I'm trying to tell you, don't design these power supplies to be 100%. So in this example, we had it loaded about 50, about 60%. We could take two of the three phases all the way to 0% for 30 cycles and the PLC would not trip, okay? Um, for, in that load scenario for that power supply. Uh, and if you had it really lightly loaded, it wouldn't trip at all for 30 cycles. So that's what we basically told them. And with those improvements, projecting those improvements on their control systems, where they, in 1997, for instance, they would have tripped 18 times based on their previous design. With this employed, they tripped once, okay? Because we basically moved all those sensitivities back and away from where they were before, okay? Another thing is, we, uh, here's an example. We're using the nice cube relay, and we went into a monofilament uh, plastics manufacturer making monofilament line down in South Carolina, looked at their data. This is their power quality data from that site. They have an iGrid power quality monitor that was installed by the utility there. And so there, we're looking here at a, a metric called SARFI, which means System Average RMS Frequency Index. It basically is an indicator of how many times the voltage drops below a certain level at that site. So SARFI 70 means it, it's a count of how many times the voltage drops below 70% anomalous at that site on any of the phases. So the SARFI 70 at this site was about 31 which meant about 31 times a year, at least on one of the phases, we could expect to see the voltage drop below 70% of nominal. This is a pretty, now there were some things done by the utility to make this site a little better performing. They sectionalized some things and so that this site didn't see all of the events downstream that might occur. Um, but we got in there and started looking at their lines and they actually had a, a nice history of when everything shut down. So we were able to take that, correlate it to the voltage sags and we found out these particular lines were having the problems. The most shutdowns were lines 2A, 4A, and 1A, and 8A. So we started looking at them, 
and trying to figure out why. Well, one thing that really was surprising when we started going down these lines was they were using ice cube relays for e-stops. Okay? So they had ice cube relays, and then they used ice cube relays as the interposing relay to start every one of these little motors, or every one of these drives down through the whole line. So this was a perfect application for using uh, the nice cube. So here's the AC ice cubes. And uh, we went in and found a few uh, places we could uh, um, uh, make this process more robust in each cabinet. So they were dropping out around 75% of nominal. This is what track with their, their data that they had too, which was right in line with the relay. Uh, we had one mini disc app, uh, recommendation, but the rest of them were all nice cube recommendations. And in the end, uh, we ran some, uh, some numbers on looking at net present value. Their initial outlay was $2,200. The installation cost for the lines that we looked at was $2,000. That was very generous for installation of this stuff. It's so easy. Um, looking at the annual benefit, they thought they could avoid three process upsets per year at about $5,000 per process upset. Uh, the payback was um, determined to be about four months. Um, with the, this investment number and this return number per year, uh, based on the number of times you won't shut down. The net present value, about $51,000 over a five-year lifetime at 8% discount. So uh, they went ahead and did this. And uh, very simple, we just in, uh, pulled out the old relays, put in the nice cubes. This is the first plant we, we were able to help put the nice cubes in. Made a big difference in this plant. If you look at what happened after these were installed, uh, notice we also configured the drives for ride through. So we went through all their drive manuals and where the drives had the ability to be set for ride through, we also told them to do that too. But if you look at the pre and post nice cube power quality data, there was only one point that line 1A tripped after the nice cube was installed, and that was a really deep voltage sag. So this made a huge difference. It's a very simple problem with an easy fix. We also found that you, uh, there was using an offline UPS, so we told them to stick a dynamic sag corrector in there to make it to, to work better for them, and they did. Um, didn't, trip fast, didn't transfer fast enough. Okay, so in closing here of this morning session, I've got to do this in about five minutes because we have a, a speaker coming up at 11.45. I want to talk about economics of downtime and how we justify these types of solutions. The cost of these things are pretty low. Um, acceptable paybacks. So what's the payback time that you guys need for your management to approve a project? 18 months? Yeah, not much longer than that, and they're not, gonna, they're not willing to put the money into it. And so the good thing about some of these little small solutions is that the payback can be quite quick. To calculate payback, a simple way to do it is to understand the one-time capital outlay, the cost of installation, the annual benefit, and the ongoing annual expense. Those are the things you need to know. So in looking at payback, now this is an example for a $6 million solution, but that could be $6,000 or $60,000 of solutions. If you don't fix your problem, okay, your cost of losses every year that you don't fix it just keeps on trucking up this way. You're losing all this money because you haven't fixed this problem of downtime. Once you make this investment, wherever this line crosses, like here in the first year, or wherever that payback point is, this first year here, this, this is uh, crossed. So anything after that is increased profitability through realized savings. So now we're, we're getting we're being extra, more profitable as an operation because we've, um, we've fixed this problem. The payback is calculated by net investment divided by net annual return times 12. That'll give us our payback in months. So the uh, net investment is the one-time capital outlay or the cost of the equipment plus the installation cost of the equipment. Uh, and um, you've also got the net annual return, which is the annual benefit, and that is basically the cost of the reduced downtime. How much downtime cost are you avoiding now? And then the ongoing annual expense is how much it's going to cost you to keep that system running or maintaining whatever you've done there. So let's look at an example or two. These embedded solutions can be very cost effective, and I've seen this many times, and when you run the numbers, uh, uh, it's all, a lot of times it's like, uh, you know, if you'll, you go ahead and make the leap to do this, a lot of, I don't want to sound like a salesman, but if you go ahead and, and do this, uh, it can make a lot of sense because the paybacks can be so short. Here's some example embedded solution costs for several different plants. Uh, here's a semiconductor plant, a little over $110,000 for several machines. 
a food processing plant where a boiler labeling and cooking machine were, were important. Uh, that's a, um, about 30,000. An automotive paint shop and body shop controls, a little over $20,000 in investment. Uh, for a fiber cable line, had multiple lines, um, a little under $20,000. So that's your examples of the capital outlay, the initial capital outlay. The cost of installation for these solutions, for these embedded solutions, the cost of installation can be as high as or exceed the cost of the solution. Because you, if you really want to consider it, you've got your engineering labor, if you change drawings or update drawings, you've got procurement, you've got electricians, you've got the line downtime cost to stop the line to install this thing. Uh, and then you have your any installation fixtures. So um, for some of these low cost solutions, again, it can be as much or more uh, as the hardware cost. Now you can look and find an old IEEE standard called 1346. It's kind of out of circulation, but it was a great standard. It really, um, and there's, they're still working on in, in different standards groups about putting their arms around the cost of power quality. This is a good way to think about it though. Um, it provides a good resource for calculating the cost of power quality events, looking at the uh, lost work, the lost production, cost of repair, cost of recovery, product quality, and those type of things. Adding all those things up and trying to figure it out, what the cost is, um, is, is one way to look at it. When you look at these things, understanding your annual benefit is really important. That's how much you're going to not shut down and the cost you're going to avoid after you install this. It doesn't necessarily mean you'll ride through every event. It just means you'll ride through a number of events that before you would have shut down. Okay, so if we can ride through events between 70 and 50% of nominal, we may ride through five to 10 more events per year than we did beforehand, which based on the cost of the downtime can make a lot of difference. Now, in some cases, you can project this based on the power quality data, the number of events and the magnitude and duration, and the known susceptibility of the equipment at an estimated cost per event. You can also include production line utilization rate in the event. If you're not running 24 seven at that particular process, then you may want to derate uh, uh, that a little bit. And I'll show you how to do that. The ongoing annual expense is, is typically very inexpensive for these batteryless type of power conditioners because you don't have to do anything to maintain them other than just you know, make sure they're not dust on top of them and the green light's on. And that's basically it. Uh, mean time between failure, if you're looking at these devices, like the cost of all this transformer mean time between failure, best case is probably about 25 years. Uh, most of these power electronic devices, you're probably looking at about half of that uh, for mean time between failure. But a UPS, battery-based UPS, stuck in a control cabinet, three years maybe, depending on the environment. So, you know, you can take your pick. So let's look at a cable manufacturer payback example. This uh, fiber optic cable manufacturer was losing $30,000 per each event when a cable jacketing line was running and was shut down due to power quality issues. There were seven events below the threshold line for the equipment to shut down in the previous year based on power quality data. And the utilization rate of the line was 40%. So it wasn't running every 24 seven. So it, some of the events that could have occurred might have occurred after operational hours. So I don't want to over promise what I'm going to give you. The embedded solution hardware cost was two was $3,900. It was two mini disks. And the installation cost was estimated at 3000, which was a very generous installation cost for these, this simple installation. The ongoing annual expense was estimated at $1,000 as kind of a placeholder. There's not a lot to do there uh, with these devices. Calculating this out, payback, net investment divided by net annual return. So uh, the net investment is power and district cost plus the installation cost, about $6,900 there. The net annual return is the annual benefit minus the ongoing annual expenses. So I looked at the number of events expected below the voltage sag threshold, multiplied by the utilization rate of the line um, by the cost of each shutdown. So about seven times 40% times 30,000, or about $84,000. Uh, I wanna make, I wanna then do my calculation, and when I do that, I get a payback period of about one month. So of course, these guys did it, okay? It was, once you showed them that, they're like, oh, I can, I can do that. It's only a one month payback, I can realize the savings. Okay, so that's basically uh, the basics of looking at uh, these embedded solutions and small power conditioner solutions in industrial controls. And I've given you some background on that. 
Uh, we're going to look at some efficiency things in this afternoon, so we're going to switch now uh, and do some additional talking about um, uh, some of the lab tour things that are going to happen.